Welcome to Sitcom Showdown, a podcast that reviews classic sitcom episodes and inducts them into our very own Hall of Fame. As usual, one of us has chosen a sitcom episode and the other guy has no idea what it's going to be. Will they already know it? Will they love it? Can they be convinced that it's worthy? Let's find out on the Sitcom Showdown. Hello and welcome to Sitcom Showdown episode 61 in which it is my turn. My name is Jeffers, and I'm here with Steve. Hi, Steve. Hello, listeners. Mm. What have you picked for us, Jeff? Well, I've picked a 90s sitcom. It's from the US of A. Mm. Third Rock from the Sun. Ah, notable people in this. Yes, the great John Lithgow for one, but we'll get to the cast and all that sort of thing, Mm. I imagine. Now, um, before I start ploughing into telling you about this sitcom and the cast and all the other things, have we had any any news in the sitcom world or feedback or anything? Oh, did you hear that Ben Elton confirmed that Blackadder is not going to happen? Oh, really? Mm. No, I didn't hear that. Okay. Yeah, so so these rumours... not on. Ah, uh, well, in some ways it's just as well, but in other ways it's, yeah, no, you know, damn. Just, just let it lie. Hmm. He said it's not happening without the writers and we're not doing it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, right, well, let's let's press on, shall we? Um, yes. So Third Rock... As I said, it was 90s, and it ran from 1996 to 2001 on the NBC network. Mm. Now, last time I asked you when we spoke about an NBC sitcom, wasn't that Seinfeld? And you said, I don't know. And yes. I can tell you that it is. Oh. Because Third Rock, when it started, was running on NBC. Yes. Which also had Seinfeld, obviously, running, and news radio running as well. Wow. So these, It's a pretty impressive lineup. Heavy hitting for one network to mm. have all these... Yep. Great sitcoms. I mean, Far out. My goodness. A golden era. Well, it was a bit of a golden era, I reckon. I mean, you know, NBC probably had 10 other sitcoms that were absolute garbage. Mm. Well, we don't remember those. Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, um, the episode we're going to look at is from season one, and it's the 10th episode, and it's called Truth or Dick, which I think is a play on truth or dare. Mm. Uh, but every episode, because the High Commander... As we're about to find out, his name is Dick Solomon. Yep. And so every title had the word Dick in it for whatever craziness he was going to get up to that week. Yes. Anyway, so let's launch into a description because it is space related. Uh, This show, Third Rock, is about four extraterrestrials who are on a research expedition to Earth, the third planet from the sun, Mm -hmm. uh, which they consider to be a very insignificant planet. But um, they come down anyway and pose as a human family to observe the behaviour of human beings. They're only supposed to be here for a week or two. But the High Commander, whose human cover name is Dick Solomon, he kind of becomes obsessed with the planet Earth and he wants to hang around. He decides to stay longer, which later on does have ramifications. But um, yeah, but the show's humour is principally derived from the fact that the aliens, they're attempting to study human society and Mm. understand the human condition and so they have to do a lot of reflecting on why it is we do what we do and how stupid some of it is yep yeah um so that's the humor right there but before we move on to the cast i just want to say a word about the creators bonnie and terry turner they also created that 70s show oh which was another really good successful one yeah i do have fond memories of that 70s show so are they, they writers be, then, or just, just are they the producers? Or? Yeah, well, they created it, so I'm going to assume they wrote a fair bit of it okay. before doing what all American sitcoms do and passing it on to lesser people. Yep. Rah. Pass it on to the writer's room. Mm. But I think, and maybe we should save this for the end, but I think being a couple, they can provide really good male and female perspectives mm. and cover all the bases. Any and comments? being aliens, they can, <laughs> they can do that too. <laughs> oh, Wouldn't that be funny? You've blown their cover. Yeah. All right. Have you got any comments before I launch into the cast? No. No? All right. Well, I might hand over to you. Did you explain that the third rock, Earth is the third rock from the sun? Yeah. (laughs) I did explain that. It was right there. You nodded at me while I explained it. I'll off. off. (laughs) You're in your own little dream world there, dude. You know what I was doing? (laughs) Nope. I was trying to make some kind of joke about 30 rock. Ah, 30 rock. 30 rock from the sun. 30th rock from the sun. Yes, yes. I don't know what that is. (laughs) I don't know, it'll be <laughs> asteroid, asteroid 32 zz zero dash one or something like that. One of the moons of Jupiter. Let's not get into all of that. Sorry, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm paying attention now. Right. Uh, what can you tell us then if I say John Lithgow, who's clearly the leading man of this sitcom, and say, for example, Steve, can you name any movies he's in? Not a lot other than The Crown. 
because I've seen him recently in that mm-hmm. drama series. He played uh, Churchill. Mm. Mm. Yes, he did very well. I think he won Although awards for that. Yeah, seems very tall for someone playing Churchill, <laughs> even with a bit of a stoop. Right. Yes. Did he have a big fat tum? Uh, yes. Oh, good. Of course. Cigar hanging out of his gob? Yep, cigar. Yeah, all that stuff. Right. Mm. What else is there on there? Well, he was... He's been a baddie in some movies, oh, hasn't yeah. he? Definitely. I mean, I'd say he's more of a dramatic actor than a comedy actor with the work he's done. So, yeah, he was the, the nasty dad in Footloose. Yeah, and uh, I think he was the bad guy in that Sylvester Stallone mountain climbing movie, whatever that Cliffhanger. was. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger, thank you. But anyway, I'll, I'll read the notes here. So, as we mentioned, John Lithgow plays Dick Solomon, the high commander and leader of the expedition. Uh, and so he's sort of posing as a physics professor at Pendleton University. Um, but John Lithgow, the actor, won a Golden Globe for this role in 97 hmm. for Best Actor in a Television Comedy. But hold on to your hat, Steve-O, because yes. he actually won the Primetime Emmy for Best Actor in a Comedy Series in 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. So hang on, every hang on, single hang on, hang year on. this was on. We're not... He's not beating... Uh... John Larroquette. John Larroquette. No, yeah, and I remember you said he won three in a row. And I said, has um, anyone ever beaten was that? It three or four in a row, but then he yeah. yeah, he said, he put a stop to it. He said, no more. Mm. And I think maybe at that point they started giving them to John Lithgow <laughs> <laughs> for six just, years in a row. He's the next John in alphabetical order. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. Yes, John Larroquette, John Lithgow. Well done. <laughs> ah, I'm liking this. Anyway, yeah, as we mentioned, he's a well-known famous film actor. He's, he's got at least two Academy Award nominations for Best Supporting Actor. Um, but other sitcoms include um, Trial and Error, which was a recent one that we've spoken mm. about. Oh, yes. But never... Still waiting for that one. Yeah. And a few one-off appearances in stuff. So he was in an episode of 30 Rock. Yeah. Oh, yes. There you go. But as I say, he's mainly worked as a dramatic actor, if you ignore Third Rock and, and other stuff. Um, so I think next it'll pay us to go into Kristen Johnston, who plays Sally. Yes. And is what I'd consider to be the next star of this sitcom. Mm-hmm. In terms of, you know, chewing the scenery and hogging the limelight and doing all those fantastic things. Is she um, blonde, blonde lady? Yep, tall. Yes. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she plays Sally, um, and I've described her as the hard-ass security officer and sergeant major type who is given the task of being a female human mm-hmm. and acting as Dick Solomon's sort of younger sister. So she's about 30 years old, um, and Dick Solomon would be in his late 40s, early 50s or something in this family unit they're disguised as. Anyway, Kristen won two Primetime Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series in the Sally Solomon role. Mm. She was that good. Um, But before that, she was this rising star in theatre in New York. But as far as other sitcoms go, she was a regular cast member for four seasons in something called The X's, which I've never heard of. No, it's not ringing a bell. That's about 2011 to 2015. She was cast in... The uh, aborted American remake of Ab Fab, which never got picked up. Yes. And she was cast as Patsy, of course, being tall and blonde and, mm-hmm. you know, able to do incredible comedy. Uh, but most recently, Kristen Johnson has been uh, a main cast member of a sitcom, Mom, or Mom, oh, as yeah, you I know might call one. it. Yeah. But she wasn't, you know, because it's in its seventh season now or something. Mm. And she's sort of slowly come into it and is only in the last season or two a regular cast member. Right. Okay. Hmm. All right, let's move on to Harry, shall we? French Stewart, who is all also instantly recognisable. Anyway, Harry's the sort of communications officer and the the one with the transmitter in his head. Uh, but otherwise, Harry seems dim-witted, but he, he's very smart. He's just wired a bit differently to everybody else, even for an alien. Um, and so he'd be sort of a 35-year-old human male with no job. Mm-hmm. And just his job in the sitcom is to go around being weird. I I think. So in terms of a disguise, how does he fit into the? Because they yeah. are they portraying themselves as a family unit. Yeah. So apart from this guy, there's that... Dick, and then it's his younger sister Sally and his younger brother Harry. Oh, okay. So yeah. Harry is the the younger brother. Okay. Yeah. So I so think I'm in terms of age, to... yeah, it would go Dick, Harry, Sally, mm. and then somehow Tommy fits into that as the child. So he must be the son of Dick, and there's no wife mentioned. Steve's making notes on all of this, so I'll press on. Anyway, um, French Stewart's also a cast member in the sitcom Mom, along with Sally. okay. Yep. He plays a chef or something. I don't know. I've never seen it. But he appeared in a great guest role in the sitcom Trial and Error with John Lithgow, which we discussed earlier. 
he got his break in the role of a wacky DJ in the sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati in 1992. Mm, yep. But yeah, French Stewart's also been in a bunch of movies. He was in Stargate and Leaving Las Vegas and McHale's Navy and so oh, on. Okay. But he, I think he makes a bit of a living in straight to DVD sequels, right? So There's no shame in that. Inspector Gadget 2, where he was Inspector Gadget straight to video. Wow. All these sorts of things. Um, As Inspector Gadget. Yeah. So I think, who was it? I don't know, Matthew Modine or one of the 80s Matthews or somebody. Yeah, the guy who played... <laughs> one of the 80s Matthews. Yeah, one of them. Broderick. Broderick, that's Modine. the dude. Wasn't wasn't he Inspector Gadget? I think he was. Right. <laughs> well, you wondered again. You wondered. We're wondering. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Dave, plays yes. Tommy, the information officer, an oldest member of the crew, but ironically given the body of a teenager and forced to enroll in high school. Yep. Uh, and later on, college. So he gives us all the teenage humour. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt himself, as a grown-up adult, of course, he became a movie star. And we all know him from Looper, which is a great movie, yep. and Inception, which is also great, and Batman The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. As far as sitcoms go, as a very young kid, and Jeezy must have been young, uh, in 88 he was in two episodes of Family Ties. Uh, he was in four episodes of Roseanne, all of this before he was on Third Rock. Um, he was also in 13 episodes of a sitcom called The Powers That Be in 1992, but hasn't been in any sitcom since Third Rock. Mm. So, you know, is it beneath him now to do that? It's not beneath John Lithgow. Get off your bloody high horse, John O. Gordon Levitt. Maybe he'll come back to it someday. Well, I hope so. He, he doesn't strike me as a highfalutin person. No? Oh, good. He's a bit of a nerd. He used to play Magic the Gathering. Did he really? He appeared on a YouTube channel. He brought in an old deck of his. No way. Got it out and played it with this dude. Yeah, it was classic. So, yeah, he's he's pretty down to earth, I think. Oh, good on him. All right. Yeah, no maybe worries. he'll make a return to sitcoms sometime. All right. Only a few more cast members has got to go now. Mary Albright, Dr. Mary Albright, Professor Mary Albright from Pendleton U. She shares an office with Dick. Um, she's the one who sort of unknowingly and reluctantly teaches Dick a lot about humanity because uh, mm -hmm. you know, she's an anthropology professor, so dealing with human cultures and stuff. She's the ideal person to cram him into an office with, oh. so nice device there. But that's actress Jane Curtin. Um, now, she's got a hell of a pedigree, dude. She... um. I'll want to put the librarians first, so we can yep. do the John Larroquette mm -hmm. link up there. The crossover. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Maybe when John yeah. refused to take any more awards, yeah. they had a word to her and she said, oh, what about this other John? Yeah, exactly. So Jane Curtin was an original cast member of Saturday Night Live in 75. Um, and she also won back-to-back -back Emmy Awards for Best Lead Actress in a Comedy Series for the 1980s sitcom Kate and Ally in the role of Alison Lowell which I've never heard of Kate no. and Ali, but it must be pretty good. Jeez. Um, oh, Lordy, Jane Curtin even presented the Emmy Awards in 84, 87, and 98. So. Wow. Yeah, she must have had quite a big profile then. I reckon so. Hmm. Uh, now, Nina, the office assistant to Professor Albright. And, uh, right, at the university. At the university. Yeah, having to put up with all the friction between the two professors. Hang on. Um, can we just... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Did Mary and Dick... Ever have a dalliance? Or... Oh, yeah. Yep. Is there yeah. sparks? He spent the whole series trying to, you know, win her over. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they've snuggled on many an occasion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've only got series one on DVD, dude, so I've forgotten the rest of what goes on. What's their What's their native form when they're not posing as oh, a, a I don't know. I think they're just, you know, like the Sontarans, like a cloned race of blobs or something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're a genderless clone race of blobs. Something oh, we bit, can all strive towards. <laughs> um, getting back to Nina, this is Cindy, Steady. Steady. Cindy, Cindy Carly. Um, now, the interesting thing about her is that you know she was in, uh, before Third Rock, she was in Prince of, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Martin Lawrence's sitcom Martin. But setting aside all the sitcom crap, mm. she had a, a recording contract with Capitol Records. Huh. And she uh, you know, whacked out three albums. And after she left Capitol Records, she went to Motown. Wow. Oh, hey. Far there out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what genre? Oh, I'm guessing it would be it? sort of, you know, if it's on Motown, I'm guessing it would be soul. R&B or soul. R&B, yeah, yeah, that sort of gear. Pretty um, impressive. Yeah, I reckon so. Now, lastly, Elmarie Wendell, she plays the landlord, Mrs. Dubcheck. Right, she's a bit of an eccentric. <laughs> okay. 
and obviously her upstairs loft is a is quite a spacious apartment and she rents it to the aliens not knowing that they're aliens of course um anyway so elmarie wendell she was born in the 20s and toured around with her parents as a kid performing on stage with them then she got into new york musical theater in the 50s mm-hmm. um and somehow made her way to la and she was getting appearances in Murphy Brown and Knight Rider and Murder She Wrote and General Hospital, but also Seinfeld and things like that. Ah, good honour. Yeah, that's right. Now, how much of this did you watch in the late nineties, Steve? None. None. Oh well, I no, I'd, you know, I must have watched one or two because <laughs> I know who the blonde lady is, <laughs> Sally, or not. <laughs> yeah, as the case may be. All right, cool. Well, let's go off and watch some right now. Cool. So you lied? I was bending the truth to flatter you. There's a difference. Oh, I see. So when we met, you said you were pleased to meet me. Was that a lie or truth bending? Figure of speech. And when you said that you were impressed with my resume? Polite conversation. When I moved in, you said you didn't mind sharing your office. Diplomacy. Anything else? Yes, is that really the color of your hair? Absolutely. Okay, and we're back from having just watched that episode of Third Rock called Truth or Dick, which is mm. Series 1, Episode 10, 1997. January 1997. Is everyone comfortable? Yes, we're all settled. All right, good. Tell us a story, Jeff. Much like the intro, this is going to be quite lengthy. Um, okay, so IMDB, in summarising this in two sentences, says Dick finds out people sometimes lie to get what they want, and Sally and Harry find out how hard it is to get a driver's licence. Yeah, not I a think, bad summary? Well, it's not bad. I think it sells it short somewhat. Mm. Mm. I thought it was a critique of postmodernism myself. Oh, good. I'll get you to explain that later on. Sure. So we have this cold open with all four of our friendly aliens out in the car on a starry night. And they're sort of parked at the university campus. This is a regular opening of the show. Um, and they discuss aspects of human life that they're trying to understand. Anyhow, this time, they're instead listening closely to James Brown. Mm. Get on it. Um, yeah, so they're sort of somehow both grooving and thoughtfully... Mm. Contemplating. Contemplating the lyrics and stuff. Um, anyway, the campus police rock up and they say, yeah, listen, it's 2am, who are you guys and what are you doing here? And he asks for Dick's driver's licence. So Dick explains he's also campus property as well as being on campus property. Yep. And hands over his campus ID as Professor Solomon. So the security dude seems satisfied with this and he goes on his way. And Sally asks, what's a driver's license? So Dick theorizes it's some sort of human validation token or something. And he Mm. he just says to Sally, look, you go and get one. Go and investigate. For the good of the mission. Yeah. And that sets up the whole B plot of the episode. And then the opening credits roll with all the planets flying everywhere and the groovy rock and roll music. Um, Anyway... Yeah, it was a good opening. So we got a few James Brown jokes and the, the crew nearly giving the game away on their alienness when they, they try to report a missing star to the security guy. Mm. So uh, he was driving without a license, presumably. Yeah, this whole time. At this point. Yeah. And the campus guy asked Dick, is this your family? And he goes, yes, that's just what we were aiming for. Yeah. Oh, dear. That's right. Pretty. So after the opening credits, we're in Dick's office. And Dr. Mary Albright, you know, shares that office with him and he's there on his own at the, at the time. He's trying to kill a fly. So in the typical style of this show, it's something that Dick is trying to do, presumably for the first time. Mm. And he's kind of just standing calmly, eyes closed, trying to locate the fly by sound. And he's going to pretend he can't see it, so it'll come out and, you know, let him oh. locate where it is. Anyway, so he's sort of saying stuff like, I can't see you, you can't see me, we're doing this. And Nina strolls him, just as Dick is saying, I know you're in here, in the room here somewhere, I can feel it. And then she says, good morning, Dr. Sullivan, and Dick whacks the <laughs> mail with the fly swatter, because Nina's holding a big pile of mail and stuff. Uh, anyway, he surprises her. It's just one of the, one of the many reasons she thinks he's completely bonkers. Um, anyway, so it's a, there's this letter for Dr. Albright and Dick rips it out of the hand of poor Nina and says, oh, it's a letter belonging to her. Oh, she's fantastic. 
the way she opens her mail and Nina's like, oh, I knew you had a thing for her. And he responds by going, yes, but I understand. I can't show it to her without her permission. <laughs> Why? Um, anyway, in a nutshell, this scene is about how Mary, who strolls in, she sort of says, I can't make it to the rules committee meeting on Friday. Mm. I feel terrible, but she'd so love Dick to go along in her stead as he yes. gives such a good impression to the committee, being a genius. And, and everyone on the committee really wants to meet him. Um, and sure, she, she sure. loves his jacket, blah, blah, blah. And Dick's so overwhelmed at actually getting some positive vibes from Mary that he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he says, yeah, he, I'm not prepared. I don't know what to do. And he's got nothing ready to share with him. But Mary just says, listen, don't don't do anything. Just go along and hand out these notes I've prepared. And you won't have to do anything else. It's a pretty mindless group and they wouldn't recognize a new idea if it bit them on the ass anyway. So don't bring up anything controversial. Just go along and be yourself. Anyway, yep. Dick agrees to go and he's sort of loving the idea that Mary needs him and all his impressive qualities. Yep. And thus, the A-plot is set up. Yes. Ah, oh, wow. Anyway, we next find ourselves at the DMV where Harry and Sally are in a line to register Sally for a driver's license. And as usual, Harry's just been awkward and weird and Sally's all impatient and militaristic. Mm. So she's looking at how the whole operation works. And she can't believe the inefficiency and she observes everything, telling Harry various ways to improve the queuing. Yeah, I could relate to this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Um, anyway, she's getting more and more irate, though. Does that happen to you? Uh, or do you keep it together? You know, I was, yeah, I can keep a lid on it. <laughs> she was struggling there. Oh, yeah. So Harry says, look, these are all good ideas. I think you should share them with everyone to help out. And so Sally just puts her hands up. She goes, OK, everybody, listen up, people, and no one gets hurt. And everyone in the DMV hits the floor. Stuck. Yeah. And so that all goes as you think it might go. Now, at this point, we have cut back to the apartment where Dick arrives home and finds young Tommy lounging on a chair in front of the TV where he, you know, Dick's not happy because apparently he's been there mm. all day. Tommy's supposed to be out and about interacting with humanity, you know, and learning stuff about mm. them. So Tommy says that being an adolescent, he doesn't want to go out because everything annoys him and he doesn't want to be out there. Um, but before they can elaborate on this, Sally and Harry burst in, relating how they've managed to escape the police, uh, but their mission at the DMV was a failure. Yes. Oh, uh, so it was he trying to get an, a, license a license as well? As well. I guess he figured while he was there, he might, might as, as well, well get a license. While he's standing in line. Yeah. Sally's very frustrated at all this red tape bullcrap you have to go through to get a mm. license. She says, what do people have to do on this planet to get what they want? And Dick relates this story of how easy it is because Mary mm. needed his help that morning and all she had to do was ask. Yes. So wanting to know the secret, Sally sort of goes, well, hang on, what did she say? And Dick relates this story of um, that she was saying she really needed his help and he looked wonderful and that he's a genius and all these things. Yep. And so Sally and Harry and Tommy realise something's <laughs> not right here. <laughs> they said that about you. Um, yeah. Dick's... They tell him that humans can do this thing called distorting the truth. Mm. And he gets very upset at all this, saying that Mary would never lie to him. And, uh, you know, just because Dick would never lie, he assumes that humans won't, but that's just dead wrong. Anyway, he's very upset. Um, and this also gives Tommy an opening to vent his frustrations. So he gets up and he says, right, as the oldest member of the crew, I have a duty to tell you that this planet both wipes and sucks in that order. And that his body transfer has gone wrong. Yep. So he, he reports that he's growing hair randomly, he smells, and that his seal is broken and he's oozing oil. At <laughs> which point, Tommy whips off his beret and he's got this massive red pimple on his forehead. Yeah. Bottom line is things aren't going well for our crew. No, no. Ah, at any rate, we move forward to the night of the rules committee meeting with a close-up on Dick. Now, this is an identical close up to the one we got at the beginning of the episode in the office where yep. he's sort of standing stock still and he's trying to catch this fly and he's just listening and moving his eyes left and right trying to follow this fly deep in concentration but in the background we can hear someone calling the meeting to order and introducing mm. dr solomon and so he sort of um decides to forget the fly now that he's the center of attention which he loves, and he sits down on one of the chairs arranged in a semicircle around the centre of the room. And basically, that at this point, we cue a brilliant bit of monologue as he talks to the group. Yep, to the other professors. Yeah. And we're going to put in a clip. First of all, 
First, on behalf of Dr. Albright, I would like to say welcome to this big waste of time. I must say I've always wanted to put a face with those men whom she affectionately calls the Knight of the Teaching Dead. And may I say you do not disappoint. I can tell at a glance that you indeed are a mindless and dull group. So I would like to start with a fresh idea that you won't recognize when it bites you on the ass. So yes, as you say, Steve, uh, Dick's basically insulted the hell out of the whole group of professors. Mm. And the bloke next to him, who I believe is Dr. Byron or something, he goes off saying Dick's disgracing Dr. Albright and disgracing the group, and Dick whacks him on the forehead with a rolled up paper. <laughs> because this guy has a mole on his head that Dick thinks is the fly. Yes. And this academic <laughs> guy, Dr. Byron, he's just stunned. Can't believe he's been whacked in the head with a newspaper. And Dick whacks him again with a newspaper, then realises it's not a fly. And he gets closer to this guy. And he goes, oh, loudly, you've got a mole. Yeah, and he's resting his hand on the guy's head throughout this. <laughs> I'm glad you brought this up, because that's in my list of gags. Oh, dear. And then he follows up by going, it's a really big, ugly mole. And this is all classic Dick Solomon, right? Because he's incapable of mm. embarrassment. He doesn't know what's going on. He always tells the truth. He always tells the truth. Now, we cut later to Mary and Dick's office, and Mary's very unhappy, obviously, because reports have got back to her that Dick's completely disgraced her, mm. and um, and the rules committee aren't very happy about his brutal honesty. Anyway, so um, she's going off on poor old Dick, and he's gobsmacked, because he's, he's literally gobsmacked, I think. Uh, he'd done everything right in yeah. his mind. yeah. Which is tell the truth and try and be charming. And Mary says, look, all he had to do is go along and feign interest. And then Dick stands up and goes, I don't feign. I always tell the truth. And then we cue this brilliant interaction about the nature of lying and flattery that devolves into childish horseplay (laughs) and ends up with Mary killing the fly, which has reemerged. And Dick's upset because it was his fly that he was hunting. Yeah. (sighs) Yes, I know it was. (laughs) Yeah. And she hands him this dead fly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, moving ahead, right? So we're we're now in the classroom where Dick's actually doing a bit of teaching for a change. Um, and he's teaching the uni students physics. So he's equating <laughs> scientific proof with conditional truth. And it soon becomes clear that he's got this bee in his bonnet about establishing what truth is. And he's trying to run it by the kids. Mm. Oh, so he says, right, here's three Einstein equations on the board. Now, only one of these is an actual Einstein equation, and the other two are not, and can you pick the real one? And so after the the dumbasses in his class fail to pick the right one, he goes, it doesn't matter because I made them all up and none of them are true. Yep. Because lying accomplishes nothing, and he says, you have to tell the absolute truth or you confuse people. But then Mm. the kids point out that you can't always tell the truth, and sometimes you have to lie, and Dick learns a lesson there. Anyway, we cut back to the Solomon's apartment. Is that illustrated? Uh, when scene. Leon tells him a bit of truth or something. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, it wasn't very exciting, so I didn't go okay. into into that. Right, yes, back at the apartment. So Tommy's hiding out again. He's being bad. He should be out there yep. hanging with people. Anyway, so uh, the landlord, Mrs. Dubchek, comes in. She's cool. Uh, she just was saying, listen, I've got your spare key. Don't lose it. Here mm-hmm. you go, Tommy. Um, And she can tell that he's sort of moping around the house, I guess. And she says, listen, I'm going out to get some smokes down the shops. Do you want to come with me? And he goes, yeah, whatever. And grabs his knapsack and off he goes. But there's some nice little interplay gags there with them too that I might bring up later on. So they go off to the mall. And then we're at the DMV all of a sudden where Sally's giving the driver's license thing another try. Now, miraculously, Steve, she's at the front of the line here. Obviously, she's done a written test and the dude's going to give her the results. Sadly for him... He has to tell her that she's failed the written test and that she should come back in three weeks. And she, in typical Sally Mo, goes, I'm not coming back in three weeks. I need this license now. Rah, 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 rah. Mm. And then she twigs, hang on, these humans yes. can use lying she was flattery. Probably going to break his neck. <laughs> she thought, hang on. It could be a better tactic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she remembers this and she starts throwing compliments at the, at the dude and using feminine wiles to manipulate him. And she succeeds. In getting another go at the test. So, well done. I think from this point onwards, she's realised the sheer power of manipulation and she's going to start trying it on everybody. So we switch back over to the apartment. Now, Dick has got home from uni and he's been sitting on his own. And Tommy walks in and he's finished at the shops with Mrs. Dubchek. Mm. 
And Dick was worried as he didn't know where Tommy was. But Tommy's a bullion, uh, if that's how you say it. And he's on a high, right? Because he's been to this place called the Mall, Woo! where he was among his own kind and everyone was as disgusting and oily as him. Yep. And Me we've got a clip. Fellow, fellow mutants. Yeah, exactly. Let, have a listen to this. Were you able to observe other life forms? Definitely. Everybody there was as oily and disgusting as me. It was a food court of mutants, a catalog of horrors, a freak show, and I was their lizard king. What do you do when you're there? Hang. What do you see? Stuff. I belong now. Oh, yeah. Stay out of my room. <laughs> Just as Tommy runs off laughing after telling Dick to stay out of his room, Sally and Harry come back from the DMV, and they're both waving their licenses around, and uh, somehow Harry's license is for Mrs. Wu, a 300-pound Asian woman (laughs) who's in her 50s. So I'm not sure what happened there, but eh, that's Harry for you. So Sally has got her license as well, and she's saying that their success was down to Dick's incredible leadership, and she goes on praising him. And we understand that she is drunk with power, being able to manipulate people through flattery. She's seeing if it's going to work on Dick, mm. who is loving it. Yep. And he says, what are you doing? And she says, I'm lying. Do you like it? And Dick goes, it's incredible. I thought the truth was powerful, but that's nothing compared to this. And he decides to use this new power of lying on Dr. Albright. Immediately. Yeah. So they all run off in the car. <laughs> Post haste. Yeah. And Harry goes, I'll drive because he's got his new license. And Tommy calls shotgun. Anyway, never mind all that. We're in the we're in the home stretch here, Steve-O. Um, so the crew rush down to the bar where the teachers and students hang out. And Dick parks himself next to Mary. And he's showering her with all these compliments. But sadly, they're pretty clumsy and, and crap. And she goes to walk out. But he stops her. You liked that bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he just says, look, I'm no good at this underhanded flattery because I can't lie to you because you're Mary. And he goes, can I tell you the truth? And she goes, yes. And so he just says, you know, how much he likes being around her and how nice she is and all these sorts of things, and then manages to also mm. insult her at the same time. Yeah, it goes downhill just a tad towards the end. Yes, but she realises it's the truth, and so um, she appreciates that, and she responds to it, and she lets Dick walk her home, which is very nice. Yes. Ooh. And then we go to the end of the episode, the traditional ending for Third Rock, where you know all the crew are back in the car, and it's the same, you know, at the end of the day, they do the whole in the convertible under the starry night thing and mm. then discuss what happened that day. Anyway, they're all talking about the concepts of lying and how the humans operate. And Dick's got his final soliloquy thing there. And he says, quote, I think these humans bend the truth because this is a difficult place to live. It's a lonely blue dot on the far end of the galaxy. And all the half truths and flattery and diplomacy are the lubricant that people spread on each other to get over the rough spots. And then that's the end of the show. Hmm. Yeah. Is this something they do so they can look up and see their home I off th- in the distance? I think that's right. I think that's a very nice point. Yeah. And in fact, I think in later episodes, uh, because they're on a loft apartment, they climb out the window and they're sort of on the roof of Mrs. Dubchek's where she's living yep, below. Yep. And then they look up to the stars at the end of the episode from the roof. Yeah. Later on. Mm. I suppose that means they don't have to get the car set in, which could be a bit cumbersome. Yeah. Phew. All right, I'm going to hand it over to you, Steve. Well, I got quite swept up in watching that, so I didn't write too many things down. Aha. Uh-huh. I've got a few notes. Oh, good. Um, I could talk about this jacket that Harry's wearing. It's this huge fairy jacket. Looks like the kind of thing a pimp might have worn. Yeah. It looks similar the to the one that... Eddie wears in Filthy Rich and Cat Flat. Mm. He's got a huge hairy jacket. And it's got some kind of an orange, leery orange lining as well, so it's pretty strange. It is pretty strange. And a big hood. And a big hood. He's mixing it with uh, like a, what do you call that check? The diamond. Uh, Argyle? Uh, yeah, so it's a. It's That's an from the sitcom I Didn't Know You Cared. Yes. Uh, episode number 40 something, I'd imagine. Yes, if you care to find out about that type <laughs> of knitting. It's quite, quite an interesting get up he's wearing. Well, yeah, his fashion's weird, just like everything weird about Harry. Mm, mm. And you were asking me about his squint earlier. Yeah, his squint as well. And you were saying that's something the actor put on. Yeah, I think he did it in the audition. That's the French Stuart squint. Right. Uh, that he's well known for. 
So this is something that he's doing. He wasn't born that way. His alien doesn't know how to use his eyes properly, or oh, it the... could be. Yeah, it works. Yeah, I like it. It's pretty cool. Everything else I've got is just gags. All right. Huh. Sorry, Jeff. I've let you down. Look uh, at the look at the notes I've got. Uh, it's about eight lines. Yeah. Oh no, that's a good sign. I heard you laugh out loud at least yes. five times, so that's pretty good. All right, so I'll, let's launch into gags then. Third rock yes. gags. Uh, I, now I did put clips in, as you know, hmm. because sometimes clips illustrate things so much better than us recounting them. Um, but I, I do like the DMV license hassle, and that you know Sally saying, "Oh no, it was Harry," and he says. All these things you, know, you have to go through just to get a driver's license. Imagine what you must have to go through to get a gun. Yeah. You know. And I, I, I think no matter what side of the aisle you're on, that is objectively not only true, but funny. <laughs> then they follow it up with the gag where Sally's... At the end. She calls out at the top of her voice to give an instruction to everyone about lining up properly. <laughs> and they all just drop to the ground. So I don't know. Maybe mm. yeah, it's the kind of place you'd snap. Oh, yeah. But that was a big thing in comedy at the time. I swear that, you know, married with children were always, you know, Bud had a job at the DMV and Al lost his license. This mm. is married with children. Um, I think any time you say Bud and Al, people should know it's married with children. Yep. So there was that going on in the 90s. And I think Seinfeld must have done some DMV stuff, surely. Everyone likes to pile on the DMV and the post office. Yep. Um, now, this mole thing with... Mm. Dr. Byron in the Rules Committee, and as you pointed out very wisely there, Steve, John Lithgow's standing up above this guy who he's just whacked on the head with a newspaper, who is sitting down, Yep. and he just rests his hand on his head where he's been closely inspecting his mole. <laughs> and uh, I've just written down that he's resting his hand on this dignified chap's academic's head like he's a, like you would to a child or a, a monkey or a pet or something mm. like that. Yeah. I was really into it. (laughs) Is that something they scripted or he just threw that in there? But it's just a beautiful bit of acting by John Lithgow to leave his hand on the guy's head. You'd have to be his height to pull it off. I think you would, yeah. Oh, my goodness. What a nice touch. Because the guy is literally at waist height on John John Lithgow (laughs) when he's sitting down. Yeah, that was a corker. Yeah. Now, there's a little bit of wordplay. I mean, there's all sorts of different types of humour in Third Rock, which is what I like about it. Um, so this one's, you know, when they're talking about the nature of honesty and they're having their big argument and everything, and Dick's in trouble for having told the truth at the Rules Committee, and Mary is saying, listen, you can't just go around telling the truth. And if you think everyone should tell the truth, Dick, I'm going to tell you some truths that you won't like. And she goes, I'll be brutally frank. And he goes, oh, good, I'll be genuine Dick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cool. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to insert any ooh or shall I continue on? Uh, well, the James Brown gag, I don't think you've done that justice. No? Okay. What was that? I can't. Oh, right, because they're listening to Get On Up. Yes, yeah, so they're. And he goes, of... and I'm on the scene like a sex machine. John Lithgow says something like, have you noticed that James Brown's always getting he's somewhere? He's, he's getting down, up, he's all getting over the down, place. getting back. Yeah. And Sally says, oh, we should speak to him as part of our research about what it's like to be human. And then Dick goes, well, he's, he's not a, human. He's, he's, he's more of a machine. A he's sex machine. <laughs> oh. uh, it was a yeah. fantastic start to the episode. It was good. There was a really nice moment in the scene where Nina's with Dick and then Professor Mary comes into the office and she's saying something along the lines of, uh, you know, she's got this thing on Friday night with the rules committee and Nina says something along the lines of, you can't back out now. You can't back out now. And, you know, the chances of you finding anyone. Finding some other idiot. Stupid nut. (laughs) And then she just, it's just great timing because she she cuts herself off in mid-sentence perfectly because she realises what the plan is going to be with Mary. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, Mary does give her a look though. Yeah. Just shut up. Yep. <laughs> a steely gaze. But it's fine. It's fine. It's all gone over Dick's head. He hasn't, he's none the wiser. Oh, yeah. He was probably still reeling from the first compliment where Mary goes, Ah, oh, Dr. Sullivan, yes, I've, I've just been thinking about you. Yes. Hmm. And that would have set him off on waves of something and he doesn't notice the conspiracy. Yes, I liked how she was shamelessly manipulating the poor man. Or a poor alien. <laughs> Oh, yeah. She just thinks he's a poor man. Yeah, that's right. Well done. You'd think she would have known 10 episodes in that asking him to be involved in anything is disaster. Yeah. 
but you know then there wouldn't be a show yep that's right you'd have to frame the the mission you're giving him in very specific terms <laughs> um so dick is doing this einstein thing with the students but in order to do it he he goes now einstein once said and then he reels off this big thing in german now to dick very being an alien well. yeah that's right and probably perfectly pronounced john lithgow probably spent days on that mm. anyhow um he obviously knows all the languages on Earth because he's a super intelligent alien yep. who has to know all the languages. But he doesn't realise that humans don't know each other's languages and he's getting no response from the kids. And he's just thinking, these bloody stupid humans don't even know German. He goes, all right, I'll simplify. And it's just fantastic. I thought that was pretty good because he's so exasperated. Well, and I thought he... I kind of got the impression that he didn't realise that he was speaking in German. And then someone oh, points out to him, "You're speaking in German." You're speaking in German, and he goes, "Ah, oh, whoops." Oh no, I, he said, I'll simplify "Yes, it for yes, you, Einstein was German." There's definitely yeah. something he doesn't he doesn't really he hasn't really clicked as to what's going mm. on. Yeah, no, that was really good. Right, have you got another one there? Yep. Yeah. There's the scene where Tommy's having a bit of a teenage grump, and they were talking about pimples or something like that, and they said, "Our old man, because he's older." Yeah. He's the oldest one of the four aliens. They go, oh. Our old man is becoming a boy, yeah. which was hilarious, but it doesn't really work. No, I <laughs> never realised it didn't work. Our old man is a boy becoming a man. <laughs> that would be more accurate. Yeah. yeah. But probably, yeah, not as good a line. On the surface, it works just fine. Yeah. No, that was a good one. And and on that topic, though, it's um, when Mrs. Dubchek comes in and sees Tommy moping about... And she gone, oh, you know, poor kid. And she says, oh, I remember what it was like to be your age. And he goes, yeah, I remember what it was like to be your age. <laughs> and, you know, she's in her 80s or something. And, ah, oh, yeah, that was a nice line as well. He says, I can't even grow a moustache. And she, he says, <laughs> how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> she just gives him a look. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <sighs> yeah, that was good. I like that one. Can we talk about the organ donor line? Yes, because I thought it was Harry's a quick throwaway Harry... line. Sorry, I thought it was a quick throwaway line. Well, what would they see if Harry <gasps> died in a car accident? And they cut him open. Oh, good point. Yes. So, oh, well, see, then that brings up another question, doesn't it? Is are they actually in human bodies? In which case, they'd be just fine. Mm. Or are they squishy aliens inside just a human lining? Mm, mm. Now, but let's use another sitcom, Steve-O, one that I never talk about on Sitcom Showdown, Final Space, mm. when he was in the skin ah, of the... Yeah, the hublot. <laughs> hublot skin. Can you explain this, and is it a similar concept? Uh, well, as a disguise, they I think they buy the skin of a dead hublot mm. for Gary. That's uh, got a zip in it, and you yeah, can zip yourself yeah, in Yeah, so he zips himself into this skin, but then later in the episode... He somehow gets deposited in the apartment of the family. Of the of, person of who the, the skin the was dead taken from. Oh. And they think that he is their dead mother. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which so, I thought was just a fantastic gag. It is a fantastic gag. But it's the exact reverse of what we're talking about, of course. So it's a human being put seamlessly into an alien's body to the point that the family don't even know it's a human in the alien's body. Yeah, and then the kids are <laughs> going, pulling on each side of... <laughs> Gary's arms, and they basically rip the suit apart in this big squelching mess. Oh. And he's left standing there going, ah. It doesn't go oh. well. That's very good. And even worse is he drops onto their car out of nowhere in yes. traffic later on. Later on. Yes. Going, oh, kids, it's me, <laughs> your mother. Uh, right, anyway, where are we up to? You liked the uh, the organ donor gag. Oh, I didn't. Oh, you, it no, was brought no, up a just, question. Yes. Right. Raised that question in my mind <sighs> as to whether they'd been put into human form or whether they were just aliens underneath a human disguise. Yeah. Right, I'm going to go I was a bit for... concerned that they were going to cut him open and find something weird in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going for the former, that they're uh, just in completely human body. Well, it would make sense of the mm. getting pimples and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you going to talk about this fight that Dick and Mary have? Well, they have two. All I've got written here, and I was going to it's hand it over hard... to you, well, and my note says grabs her belt. Well, it starts with her trying to demonstrate what it is, misdirection, or something like that. Right. Because she says, oh, what's that thing on your shoulder? And then when he looks at... Oh, no, he goes, oh, your tie. what's that on your tie? What's that on your tie? Thing. And then, you know, you, you flick the finger the up to the nose. Yeah, yeah. Flick the finger. 
And then he says, oh, what's that thing on your shoulder? And then he slaps her right across the face. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he doesn't scream or anything like that. She just goes, right, <laughs> I'm going to up the ante. So then she like pulls his shirt out of his pants and then he grabs her. He goes from to behind grab and her blouse and <laughs> grab her out blouse and stuff. Another thing he doesn't know he shouldn't do, but yeah. yeah probably shouldn't undress your colleagues in the office. <laughs> oh. But then, even better, out of nowhere, Dick sees the fly again halfway yeah, through yeah, this yeah, entanglement right. and he lets go of <laughs> she goes, Mary ah! and gets <laughs> funk <laughs> falls to the floor. Oh. And then he's stalking it with the, the fly swatter, and Mary, who in a brilliant bit of physical humour pops up from across the room because she's crawled over there from mm. when he dropped her out of sight of the camera and sprays the fly. Oh, the whole exchange is good. Yes, that was gold. Ah. And then they have a bit more of that in the final, well, not the final scene, but the second last scene. In the pub? In the pub because she goes to leave and he grabs her by <laughs> by the belt. And she's dragging him across the room. <laughs> He's on a, yeah, what do you call it? A chair. <laughs> a chair with wheels on chair? it, thank you. No. What do you call those chairs? Swivel chairs. Right? Yes. I didn't think he was. So she's got okay. hold of her by the belt and she's dragging him across the bar. That's oh. very funny. It's the definition of making a scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah don't yeah. make a scene. He's always making a scene. Uh, all right. The last gag I've got, and then I'll hand over to you, is that he, um, at the beginning when she's trying to butter him up to go to the meeting, she goes, oh, is that a new jacket? And he goes, I'm entirely new, which is brilliant. But he's got to calm down with those sorts of statements or he'll give mm. away that he's an alien. Yep. Oh, and the other thing I really like is that after she's convinced Dick to go to this meeting and buttered him up and he leaves feeling very pleased, she turns around, Mary does, and says to Nina, another five minutes and he would have given me a kidney. <laughs> Which is another well, great line. You don't want a kidney from an alien? No, we've already covered that. Yeah. Oh, no, it'd be a brand new kidney, steve with no wear and tear on it. Yeah, I guess. Yay. He's the ideal candidate. Now, have you have you got other stuff written no, down? No, that's there? it. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm at the end of my list too. All right, cool. Well, it's time to put the case. So what I like about this sitcom, it's the joy at seeing people experience things for the first time. And, you know, it's got its moral lesson. The whole thing is perspective, right? So we go through our lives just doing things almost on automatic. And what good art can do is give you a new perspective on the everyday and make you appreciate what you've got that's what art's supposed to do but the, the what happens here though is that these guys are experiencing things for the first time obviously this is part of the joy of having kids is because you can see the first time they eat ice cream and their little faces all light up or the mm. first time they go on a carnival ride and they go and this is the best thing ever and then you're remembering what it was like for you and then you know it's really heartwarming and stuff except with these guys being adults and aliens, when Dick experiences something for the first time, or Sally or whatever, they're able to fully articulate the amazement of how it feels to do that mm. thing, or the experience they're having. And they often do it in public in a highly embarrassing way. And I just think it's really, really nice, and it gives you that perspective. And it's the it also works with the pain they go through when Dick realises he's been lied to, and you know these intelligent aliens... Through them, we can sort of share with them what it's like to do all that stuff. And yeah, like I said, it's a new perspective. So it reminds us of all the joys of life that we take for granted, mm. I think. And we've become immune to them. And they do it in a way where they can do observational humor. Because yeah, Seinfeld's about observational humor. And he observes things and ponders on it and then puts it in a new way for us to consider. And they do that as well, big time in Third Rock. Except... Unlike Seinfeld, they've got the whole family dynamic thing going on, which is because they, they're on a mission and they have to be together, whereas mm. Seinfeld, it's friends. Yep. Uh, anyway, yeah, so it's, I think it's up there in the perspective stakes with My Name is Earl, which you know I love for improving oneself, and The Good Place as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I put Third Rock in that category of, I don't know, I haven't got a name for it. But sitcoms that make you... Self-improvement sitcoms. Yeah, self-improvement sitcoms is... <laughs> now... But, is Third Rock a self improvement sitcom? They, they're all trying to. Are they improving themselves. us? Yeah, they could be, and they're trying to improve themselves. Anyway, um, self examination sitcoms, introspective sitcoms, introspective sitcom. Yes, that sounds boring. And yeah, action packed, <laughs> uh, with lots of Where slapping. Slap each other. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. And I think it deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And this episode in particular, 
is as good an example as any. So what do you think? Do you reckon this this episode is enough to get Third Rock into the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Oh, really? I thought that was pretty hilarious. And uh, these themes never get old, do they? No. This episode's 22 years old, but it's still pretty darn fresh. Yeah. It hasn't aged badly. Yep. I like the way it's bookended at the beginning and the end with the scene in the car where they're pondering things and figuring things out together. Yeah. Yep. Drawing it all to a conclusion at the end. Yep. No, that was really good. Oh, excellent. Very well chosen. Oh, good. So that's another one in the bag. Mm. And of course, it's your turn next time uh, when we return in around a fortnight. Mm. Yep. I'm not letting on what it is. No. Have you no. even chosen it yet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. good. All right. Well, we'll say no more. We'll get out of here and return in around-ish mm. Mm, sort of two weeks. Say no more. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, all right. Well, ta-ta, everybody. And thanks again, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. See you, everyone. Bye. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email sitcomshowdown at gmail.com. 